Okay, well, good afternoon, folks. Welcome back from lunch. Today, is, or this le lesson eight is the last lesson for today. So once we finish this one, you'll have plenty of time to work on the assignment and review for the quiz. So let's get started with lesson eight, which is anaerobic pathways. So when we think about aerobic versus anaerobic, aerobic had to do with oxygen. Anaerobic, which is the topic of this lesson, lacks oxygen. And you'll start to see some of the connections uh, between some of the gaps in cellular respiration uh, in terms of where things come from, and you'll start to see it being produced or connected to anaerobic respiration. So the without that oxygen as that final electron acceptor, uh, do we predict more, less, or same amount of ATP produced? Well, as I've alluded to already several times with regards to aerobic respiration, we know that it produces more ATP. We know that that electron transport chain that utilizes oxygen produces a theoretical yield of 34 ATP molecules. And we recognize that it is going to be way more than an anaerobic respiration process. But that doesn't mean that anaerobic respiration can't be utilized. So when you think about anaerobic respiration, you really need to think about it in terms of two pathways. That anaerobic respiration that I've alluded to that ETC uses another compound that's not oxygen as a final electron acceptor, and it doesn't work as well, but again, it's still gonna try to utilize those electrons uh, that NADH and FADH have held on to as a result of some of those chemical reactions of breaking down that glucose, and it's going to utilize that to create that um, electrochemical gradient in an attempt to create more ATP. But there's also a second anaerobic pathway and that anaerobic pathway is called fermentation. There's lactate fermentation and alcohol fermentation. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. I'll tell you about my, um, my bacterial colony and my yeast colony that I maintain in an attempt to, to bake bread. And not really an attempt. I do it quite successfully. So uh, I'll tell you all about that. I'll probably post a picture uh, to the classroom chat later just to kind of tie in the idea of fermentation and how cool it can be and how we as humans utilize it. But there's two main pathways for anaerobic respiration and pathways. That's that anaerobic respiration that uses that an, another compound that's not oxygen as the final electron acceptor, and then fermentation. So we're gonna look at aerobic respiration as a whole first to kind of compare it, and then we'll talk more about it afterwards. So when we think about anaerobic respiration, the, the most important thing here to realize is that, that organisms in low oxygen levels or oxygen-free environments, like we've talked about in the past, they utilize a distinct electron transport chain and a compound that is completely different than that oxygen that's gonna act as that final electron uh, acceptor. Because in anaerobic respiration, and I added that AN on there just to kind of make sure that we know we're dealing with anaerobic respiration, we need something other than oxygen to function as that electron acceptor. So some examples include sulfur, some of them are iron and even nitrogen, which can behave like an electron acceptor. Now, the most important thing about those ideas or those molecules is that we recognize that in order for them to be functional, they need to have a high electronegativity, right? They have to be able to pull those electrons from NADH and FADH stronger than the electrons desire to stick around into that electron acceptor. So any type of particle that acts as a final electron acceptor needs to be highly, 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 highly electronegative. So some examples of those highly electronegative um, electron acceptors that we see in the wild, so to speak, are when if you've ever been to a wetland or a marshy area or a bog area, that rotten egg smell, that smell of rotten eggs is as a result of bacteria that produce sulfur byproducts, hydrogen disulfide or dihydrogen sulfide, sorry, as a waste product from the electron transport chain that they utilize to create that ATP. So they will fix sulfur and they will utilize sulfur as an electron acceptor and that sulfur will accept electrons. And one of the byproducts, much like water is a byproduct in the electron transport chain for aerobic respiration, dihydrogen sulfide is a waste product in those bacteria or those organisms that use sulfur as a, an electron acceptor. 
So you can see that it's similar to the electron transport chain that cells that go through aerobic respiration uh, utilize, but instead of that oxygen, it's using something that's not oxygen. Fermentation is that other anaerobic pathway we're gonna look at. And so it's important to recall that glycolysis is a very, very ancient metabolic pathway that does not require oxygen and can occur in any cell, right? In any cell. So if an aerobic respiration, in aerobic respiration, NAD plus is regenerated. And this is where we start to see the pathways that are very similar in all cells. NAD plus is regenerated by oxidation during the electron transport chain, right? But in organisms where that does not happen, where that does not happen, we need to see fermentation happen as a result to regenerate that NAD plus after glycolysis occurs. So when we think about that fermentation process, it's all in an attempt to, um, it's all in an attempt to regenerate that NAD plus. Uh, so is the first three stages the same except electron exception? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second, okay? So when we think about fermentation as a process, um, it's important to recognize that it's all in an attempt to regenerate NAD plus to continue gly glycolysis. So when we look at this chart here and we think about glycolysis and the citric acid cycle if oxygen is present and the electron transport chain if the oxygen is present, those two processes regenerate that NAD plus that can then gets shuttled back out into the cytosol and then that process can start all over again. However, if oxygen is not present, if oxygen is not present, fermentation happens where it will still utilize that NADH that has been oxidized, but now instead of it being in such large proportions as a result of oxygen being present, it's smaller and then it's less efficient in terms of producing ATP. But again, it still is an important component of all organisms. And we'll talk about lactic fermentation right now. So when I talk about fermentation, it's very important to recognize that there's gonna be two forms of production of different molecules in that fermentation process. The lactate and alcohol ethyl fermentation are the two main ones we're gonna talk about. Some organisms use these as a primary source of energy, while others like us, utilize it as a supplemental energy source when oxygen is limited. And one reason oxygen might be limited is again, going through that idea or that um, similar argument from last lesson where going on a run taxes the body. When oxygen doesn't quite reach all of the cells that are working hard, like your muscles, for example, they go through that lactate fermentation, which is why your muscles hurt when you exercise and you do too much, or not too much fitness, but when you run or when you do exert yourself in any way, shape or form, your muscles start to burn because they're literally producing something that hurts them. And it's in an attempt to supply it with energy. So it seems kind of counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll talk more about it as we move. So what is that goal of fermentation? Well, again, it's to regenerate that NADH or re regenerate that NAD plus from NADH. So glycolysis can produce those two AT molecule, ATP molecules per glucose. Because without that regeneration of those electron acceptors, the NADH would never be able to be formed and then we wouldn't be able to produce ATP as a result. So there's still a net gain of two ATP in this type of fermentation. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So let's take a look at alcohol ethanol fermentation. So some examples that go through those processes are like I alluded to earlier, yeast and some bacteria slash archaea. So what are the steps in alcohol fermentation? So glycolysis occurs as normal, producing a net two ATP and two NADH slash H plus, as well as those two pyruvate. Recall from any glycolysis process in any cell, it's always going to produce a net, a net of two ATP, two NADH H plus, and to pyruvate. That's always gonna be what's produced in glycolysis, regardless of what cell or species or what have you, okay? Always, 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 always. So to allude to that question that was just asked, that's what's produced in glycolysis. The next step, however, is going to be a little bit different. We have what's called the decarboxylation reaction, which results in the removal of CO2 gas from that pyruvate. So that CO2 gas gets removed 
from pyruvate. And that's where that CO2 gas gets perform or, uh, produced as a result of that uh, ethanol or alcohol fermentation. What's then used to make that further bit of uh, energy is that acetyl aldehyde is now reduced by NADH to form that NAD plus as well as ethanol. Now, this is very important because now we have that, again, that net two ATP gain, as well as that NADH gets reformed into NAD plus, and then those hydrogen ions can get kind of restocked and that NAD plus gets restocked and it allows for that process to kind of happen all over again. So the net reaction, including glycolysis, is this. This is the net reaction. So at the start, the reactants are a glucose molecule, two NAD plus, right? That's part of that cycle. And then that produces two ethanol, two CO2, two ATP, and then two NADH. So that entire reaction produces all of those things on the right-hand side. So again, the net reaction, including glycolysis, this is including glycolysis. It's gonna be glucose plus that two NAD plus, which provides you with two ethanol, two CO2, two ATP, and two NADH, okay? And then with regards to the equation above, that's just the net reaction of alcohol fermentation, okay? I've now included the glycolysis reaction in this stage here. So this is the big one for you to know. I just showed you the uh, ethanol fermentation process with that equation above. This is the big one. That's glycolysis and that alcohol fermentation combined. So what are some applications of that alcohol fermentation? Well, as I alluded to earlier, um, I make bread quite often and I've created a starter, a, ye a live bacterial culture essentially filled with yeast and bacteria, which I use to bake bread. And that bacteria goes through alcohol fermentation. And when it does that, it starts to produce different flavors and sugars as a result of it. It's going to also produce that CO2, that gas which helps to give bread, a leavened bread, uh, that light airy pockets and those textures and those air bubbles that make bread so light, fluffy, and delicious. So not only will it produce very specific flavors as well as very specific sugars, it's also going to help that dough become aerated with CO2. So we as a species have many, many different uh, uses for alcohol fermentation, but it's not limited to the ones that we've just talked about here. Okay, now for the final thing to talk about with regards to this lesson, that lactate fermentation. And this is going to be the most important one because it has that direct use to how human beings uh, utilize non-oxygen environments and how it kind of works in conjuncture with that aerobic respiration. So used as a primary energy source for microorganisms, it also is going to help supply, and those microorganisms are bacteria and archaea, it also supplies supplemental ATP in those aerobic eukaryotic cells like us. So in human muscle cells, when ATP demands exceed the rate at which O2 can be supplied because of respiration issues or just the sheer volume of oxygen required to make that cell work isn't really happening, we can start to look at lactate fermentation as a means to kind of step up and help produce some ATP. This is going to also, oops, um, and again, that oxygen and that aerobic activity. So at the rate which O2 can be supplied to the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. So when that ETC doesn't get enough oxygen, it basically sends a signal to the cell's cytosol and says, whoa, we don't have enough oxygen. We do not have enough oxygen right now. So during those strenuous activities, glycolysis will happen rapidly and it will produce as much ATP as possible from glucose. However, that NAD plus needs time to be regenerated, okay? That NAD plus needs time to be regenerated and that process of that NAD plus regeneration is gonna work in lockstep with oxygen and if there's not enough oxygen, it's not gonna work as well. So when that pyruvate oxidates or oxidizes, sorry, that NADH and it is converted directly then into lactate and then that will regenerate that NAD plus. So that pyruvate gets bumped out 
instead of going through that citric acid cycle and, and the rest of that uh, aerobic respiration process, it's the cells, mitochondria says, okay, man, we don't have enough NAD plus right now. Um, we don't have enough oxygen. Uh, keep that pyruvate out in the cytosol and make it into lactate. And that production of lactate will regenerate the NAD plus as well as, as well as allow for that glycolysis to speed up. So now that glycolysis is producing more two ATPs because that instead of waiting for that NAD to come back, and so that way it can use it as an electron acceptor, it, the glycolysis process is sped up and that ATP production is increased in glycolysis. So when oxygen levels return to normal, that reaction can be reversed to produce pyruvate, which will continue on to the pyruvate oxidation CAC and electron transport chain. Now, with regards to that reaction that will produce the lactate versus um, versus that, um, that pyruvate, it's not really, the best way to describe it is that it, the hydrogen ions kind of get donated and then it becomes NAD plus. But uh, we're not really gonna look in detail with that process of lactate fermentation because you won't be responsible for understanding that specific pathway in that much detail. Uh, because again, the reality of it is, is you already have enough pathways on your mind to kind of figure that out. So don't really worry too much about the specifics of lactate fermentation right now, because I'm just covering it as a means to understand that it's in an alternative when oxygen and NADH, uh, or sorry, when NAD plus are not in high abundance. Okay, folks, that's the end of this lesson. I hope that it was a short, nice one in terms of our learning and understanding. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's just something for your knowledge in terms of the general big ideas. I don't want to spend too much time on those pathways because at the end of the day, you have enough pathways on your plate. So I'll end the recording here and we can look at some of the questions in the chat.